Right. All right, Romans chapter number 12, Romans chapter 12, and uh, we're going to uh, begin reading here down in verse number 9. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, uh, the Bible says here, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. But condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Lord, we pray that you will help us with these principles as we consider them uh, in light of our meetings last week. And Father, that you will uh, help us to be mindful that we allow the uh, seeds, uh, the stirring of revival to produce uh, real, uh, helpful Uh, encouraging behavior uh, in our life as a result. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I wonder when you were coming up, when you were growing up, if anybody in your family, it could have been been a mother, it could have been a father, could have been a grandparent, maybe an uncle or an aunt. One of them said to you at some point, you know what you need? An attitude adjustment. Anybody ever tell that? I tell you, tell you, I had a number of attitude adjustments in my growing up years, uh, and I deserved every one of them, and they were done the old-fashioned way. My, my dad didn't know anything about time out. Yeah. You were crying for time out, but that did not happen, all right? Uh, and uh, sure. And uh, really, I got to thinking, that's what revival is. It's an attitude adjustment. Because as we go along in life, we have a tendency for our attitude to get a little bit off. And it doesn't necessarily mean sour, although that could be the case. Uh, But it means, maybe it just means our attitude might get a little bit flat. Uh, It's just not where it should be. And so we have a stirring of the Spirit through the Word of God that, that, as we said this morning, stirs these embers Uh, to a refreshment uh, of our life in many ways. This morning we talked about how we uh, we should be sensing and and, and, uh, having uh, an urgency about the need of people for Jesus Christ and to be genuinely born again. And then we should have an urgency about us personally as believers to commit ourselves completely to Jesus Christ in everything. And that we need to have an urgency to realize how important this urgency is. We said it's important to our present as we walk with God now. It's important to our future because one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then it's important for the unbeliever because we are the light of the world. We are uh, to be the ones by uh, our zealousness for God, by our urgency for the things of God that encourage them to receive Christ as their personal Savior. And so if that's going to happen, there needs to also be uh, this, uh, this work of the Spirit in our heart as it relates to our attitude. We need God to stir us in revival for the attitudes of our heart. Now, Romans chapter number 12 is really, in the last part of the chapters we read, is really kind of a checklist, if you will, uh, uh, an attitude checklist. And we can go down through here and look at a few things uh, that uh, we should see in our life and that certainly would be a result of the Spirit of God working in us. And you could divide these uh, two groups of attitudes uh, into personal attitudes and social attitudes. In other words, 
how we are from ourselves and how we are unto others. And so as we think about that tonight, let's just see what the Spirit of God is doing in the attitude of our heart tonight, beginning with this when he says in verse number 9 that, uh, uh, that uh, we should be loving and that without dissimulation. Let love, he says, verse 9, be without dissimulation. And this love here is that agape love. It is God's love. It is a love that is not based on emotion. It is an act of the will. It is a choice. We love because it is the right thing to do and uh, because it helps the other person, not because uh, it, it, it helps us. It, uh, again, it's based upon the determination of our will. And so, uh, you know, sometimes you hear in various relationships, it could be uh, marital relationships, it could be family relationships. Some people will even go so far as to say, well, I just couldn't love them anymore. Well, that's not true for a professing believer. And you say, well, you don't know what they did to me. Wait a minute. Uh, God, uh, God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we can love as we should if we will love as we should and let the Spirit of God uh, uh, stir us toward that end. We have to get past the idea of feelings. And uh, it's true that uh, God gave us feelings. As a matter of fact, we're a little bit concerned about people that are unfeeling, aren't we? We need to have uh, feelings, but at, and, and so uh, sometimes our feelings are hurt, sometimes our feelings are stirred up, whatever it may be, and we'll have to give some space until we can grab hold of what's going on with us emotionally. But uh, after having done that, we should always choose love. God's love, agape love for our spouse, for our children, for our brethren down at the house of God, for those unsaved that we're trying to win to Christ. We need to love without dissimulation. Now, that word dissimulation means pretense or show or put on. And here again, we're reminded that real revival is not fake. Fake revival is fake, but real revival is not fake. And when our hearts are stirred unto truth, it's going, we're going to want to do away with anything that is just show or put on. It's not, a, it's not a love, this love of God. It's not a love that is kind of filled here and there with hidden motives and agendas. And sometimes you'll find people that will treat people a certain way because they have something in mind that they want to get out of that later. Now, you, you and I should not be uh, calculated like that. We should love because it's the right thing to do. Hey, the Lord loved us realizing that there was not going to be so much that in return, right? Let me tell you something. We talked about the disaster that this peninsula is spiritually this morning. God loves it all anyway. Not it, but them. God loves the people of this peninsula. God loves the, God loves the idolaters not only here in our nation, but in the nations abroad. God loves them, and Calvary's proof of that. Uh, and so there's no agenda there. Uh, Jesus Christ died, and his death on Calvary is, a, uh, is uh, uh, available to all, but effective especially on those that believe. Jesus died for all men, realizing uh, that he himself said, few, uh, with regard to the path of salvation, few there be that find it. But he died anyway. Why? Because he loved. And so no uh, hidden motives or agendas. Uh, it is this sacrificial love of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Now, the pandemic didn't help us, but the pandemic wasn't the beginning of our problem of selfishness in America. Uh, we, uh, we have a tendency to, uh, you know, be watching out for number one and thinking of ourselves all the time and what's best for us and what makes us most comfortable and all these other kind of things. Uh, but that's not Bible love. That's not agape love. That love is sacrificial. It gives for the sake of others. I don't love for my own good, but I love for the good of others. Now, is everybody always lovable? Are you? Absolutely not. But any good when somebody loves you anyway? Isn't that helpful? Uh, it might be a little bit convicting at first, but afterward, it's helpful. 
because it helps us to realize, hey, uh, you know, uh, somebody is wanting to be uh, a help to me. So uh, it is love without hidden motives or agendas. It is a love that is genuine. And that's really kind of what we're driving at. We've touched on it before in various messages. I don't want to have to feel like I've got to put on love. I want to love from my heart. I want to love the way that God loved, the way that Jesus loved. I want it to be a sincere love. Again, every time I think about this, I think about the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the man that came to Jesus, and he said, what good thing, you know, must I do in order to be saved? And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. He was completely confused. He was focused on good works instead of faith for salvation. And, uh, uh, and uh, he was wrong-headed. He was self-oriented, right? What good thing must I do? Um, And interesting, a lot of works religion is that way. It's focused on self, not God. Even the idea that I'm able to do anything about it. Uh, But uh, so what what the Bible said, the the Lord loved him. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, if Jesus loved sinners, he loved people in error. He loved people who are consumed with self. And so... What we have to do is say, God, help me by the power of the Spirit to love the way that you love. We're to have this kind of love for one another. We're to have this kind of love for a lost world. Uh, we don't want to have the, uh, a kind of love that is, um, uh, that is religious. And, you know, I think about that when people visit our church. I want to make sure, uh, you know, I want to hope, I want to pray that I and our church demonstrates genuine Christian love to people. Not a religious put on. Uh, because we're supposed to, but, be, but, but because we have a genuine concern for people that come through that door, or uh, whatever people they may be. We need to love as God loved. Uh, and uh, then also, uh, we're to have this love, of course, for God himself. Not like the Pharisees who honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. No, we want a genuine love for God. Can people that have a genuine love for God sin against him? Absolutely. They can. David did. He was known as a man after God's own heart, right? And um, uh, sure he did, because we, at a moment of here or there, uh, we will, uh, uh, you know, we will uh, yield to the flesh, uh, choose the wrong action, attitude, approach, and uh, we do it because uh, we yield to the wrong thing. But immediately when we do, there's a, a realization that that's what I did. And uh, a crying out uh, to God, like um, Brother Harper mentioned as part of the revival messages this week as it related to Moses and striking the rock, and there was plenty of time for it to occur to Moses that he'd done the wrong thing. Uh, And that didn't happen, and of course the end result was God had to deal with that. Uh, But you and I, when we sin against God, whom we love, uh, there needs to be an awareness of that and an immediate, uh, an immediate confession and repentance of our sin. A turning to God, remembering His great goodness to us. And so we are to love without dissimulation. We're to love the love of God without it being fake or having any kind of uh, 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 a shallowness about it. We want it from our very heart itself. The second attitude that he mentions here, not just love without dissimulation, but love the right things. Look at the last part of verse 9. Abhor that which is evil. Notice it doesn't say accept that which is evil. Accept. No, no. Ab, 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 I'm going to mess. I can't even say it. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I want to abhor that which is evil. There's a lot of evil in this world. And the fact of the matter is, it should be abhorrent to us. Let me tell you, if we ever come to the place in this life where we find ourselves almost um, maybe understanding or justifying evil behavior, we're in the wrong lane. We've gotten our hearts not got the right attitude. We said we're to love people, right? Uh, But we need to abhor evil. Abhor evil. And you know what concerns me? is that maybe some of us that were uh, saved later in life, we went through this matter of having, I did. I mean, uh, I got saved after an overnight drunk in jail. I mean, you know, and I've said before that when I uh, uh, had the realization even there, uh, because when I left there, I called a friend of mine that was witnessing to me, inviting me to church. You know, where's that church you go to? Well, 
uh, you know, there was a realization that my life was abhorrent. That it was wicked. It was awful. What I thought was going to be fun was terrible. There was no future in it. Uh, and uh, not just any future, but the whole idea of guilt and all that other kind of thing. Uh, and uh, brother, I'm telling you, uh, we need to abhor that stuff. Uh, and so uh, the word abhor means to loathe. Psalm 97 and 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Right. Now, hate's a word we don't like to use, but that's what's in the Bible. Uh, and so we want to hate evil. Uh, again, we uh, want to love the sinners. We want to love those. Why? Because we were there at some point. Look, you may not have been uh, in the, to the most illicit of it, uh, but, uh, you know, God is, uh, God is too holy to even behold any evil. I mean, we're so arrogant sometimes. We say, well, you know, uh, I've never killed anybody. i done, you know, I thank God. I thank God that myself I never did do any drugs. But I'm going to tell you this, uh, you know, we can have the same, uh, we can have an attitude of, of, of abhorrence for that and make excuses for our slander. Make excuses for foul attitudes and somehow or another assign them to God like the Pharisees did. I mean, they thought they were justified and the Sadducees and all that bunch to kill Jesus. So, uh, but the evil itself should be abhorrent. Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Revelation 2 and 6, but this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And so we're to hate, uh, we're to, we're, we, are, we are to hate, we are to abhor that which is evil. Now look, that's what will happen in revival. Now watch what happens. Some people, some people will believe they've had revival in their heart because now all of a sudden they feel like God loves them and God's full of grace and they can live however they want to. That's not revival, that's backsliding. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, really, as we've said before. And so uh, we, want to, we don't want to accept that at all. Uh, we want to uh, hate um, uh, all that God calls evil. And by the way, God is the right judge for it. Uh, you think about now, you know, the Bible tells us that part of the end times is they'll call good evil and evil good. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, and now, listen, our institutions are so scrambled up with some of this, uh, uh, you know, transgenderism and trying to figure out how in the world, you know, we're going to understand which restroom to go to and, uh, and then how we're going to make sure we try to get everybody's, uh, um, uh, you know, pronouns just right and all that. And, and nobody is able to say, this is madness without some repercussion anymore. You are now the problem. Really? Because I'm pretty confident which one I am. You know, I, <laughs> and so, but all of this is being uh, pushed for a reason. Uh, and uh, you and I have to realize that, man, we've got we've to let God be God and let God tell us what's right and wrong. Because where we are in a society right now is exactly what happens when God's not allowed to call it. And it's confusion, isn't it? Not just confusion, but damage. And you've heard it already. I don't want to, you probably wore out with it already. But can you imagine talking to a kindergartner about their gender as if they were able to make a choice about it? They can't even decide if they want hot dogs or hamburgers for lunch. You know what I'm saying? What are we doing? It's madness. Because we've thrown God off. And so what do we do? We abhor that which is evil. Now, I told you before, some people are like the grumpy dwarf, you know. Some people are again everything. And uh, they were talking about Snow White's uh, woman's wiles or something. And somebody asked Grumpy, he said, well, what's a while? And he said, I don't know, but I'm again it. And that's the way, <laughs> that's the way a lot of people are. It's the way a lot, of, uh, a lot of religious people are. But we don't go through life just being against everything. 
Matter of fact, he tells us here uh, in the last part of verse number nine, abhor that which is evil. Watch, cleave to that which is good. Life properly lived is good. Marriage is honorable and all, right? I mean, there are a lot of good things that God gives us to do. Uh, He gives us richly all good things to enjoy. Uh, There is life to enjoy. And so he tells us to cleave to those things. Have you heard it said that it takes about 30? I don't know how they figure this out. Maybe it's by, uh, I don't know, maybe AI is doing it. It takes about 32 days to establish a new habit. 32. Not 31.75. 32 days, 32. And what are we talking about? We're talking about maybe replacing a bad habit with a good one. Uh, It takes time sometimes for us to do that. But that's what we do when we get saved, when God comes in and changes our heart and we become a new creature. It's not that we, you know, we, now we sit, uh, as I've said before, in a potato sack with a rope around our waist and just chant the Gregorian chants until Jesus comes. We have a life to live. And we replace the bad Uh, that uh, the devil would sow to us with the good things that God has given us to enjoy in this life. And those are also defined by God. There are all kinds. We can cleave to the truth, buy the truth and sell it not. We can cleave to righteousness because righteousness prolongeth days. We can cleave to the Word of God. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Uh, We can cleave to the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We can cleave to right attitudes. Uh, For instance, the Bible, as far as attitudes, tells us not to be slothful. Look at the first part of verse number 11 right there. Not slothful in business. Not slothful in business. I remember preaching on laziness. That's what that word, you know, the, 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 uh, is, is it a sloth or a sloth? Some people call it a sloth. I call it a sloth. Uh, either way, it means slow. S-L-O-W. Slow. Uh, uh, and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, remember preaching on that thing about this matter of laziness. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and one of the young men in our churches, one of the churches came up and said, Now look, I need you to help me stop being lazy. And I thought to myself, you don't want me to help you stop being lazy. (laughs) I mean, what are you saying when you tell me, you want me to show up at your house at four in the morning? That's when I get up. I'd be glad to come by and, good morning. Ready to roll. You know, is that what you're talking about? No. What do I need to do to stop being lazy? I said, go to work. That's how that works. You know, a lot of, I don't have time for this uh, sideline, but uh, the idea here is that we, uh, that we need to uh, be uh, uh, engaged in life and engaged in our, on our job and engaged in the house of God. Don't be just sitting around, lying around all the time. Uh, f- uh, think uh, of... Uh, uh, all that God has given us to do in prayer and the study of his word and various activities uh, uh, that we can be involved in with our families and uh, in our churches and all that. Uh, there's plenty to be in- engaged in. Matter of fact, I've told you before, yeah, it boggles my mind when somebody's kind of, well, I'm not sure there's anything to do. Are you serious? <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm so busy, I don't even have time to write a list so the next time somebody says that, I can hand it to them. Here's a few things you can do. Yeah. There's plenty to do. Uh, and so we need to, but we need to uh, uh, slough off this lazy. People don't read their Bible because they're lazy. People don't pray because they're lazy. People don't come to church because they're lazy. You know, uh, people don't get the, I, I went by the home of uh, uh, the uh, garden of the slothful and all the walls were falling down and uh, they weren't uh, taking care of the things like they should. Why? They're lazy. They're lazy. The Bible says, don't be doing that. You need to be fervent in spirit. So don't be slothful, but be fervent in spirit. And that word fervent, we've looked at before uh, in kind of a different context, but it has the idea of effervescent. You might hear like Alka-Seltzer. That's the awfulest stuff. It's about like that Q-Nol stuff, that Q stuff uh, that someone was drinking for COVID. It's awful. I mean, terrible. And, uh, uh, you know, I thought maybe, you know, when I first took it, I'm like, oh, this is really going to be helpful, right? And even when they put flavors on that stuff, isn't you know. But look, when you drop that thing in that water, you know what I'm talking about. And look, that's the way our life should be. 
just, you know, especially spiritually. And that's what that Jesus said. He said that he would be a well springing up unto everlasting life. There needs to be an effervescence about our faith. That's what this word fervent means, uh, that we're to be boiling over. Uh, there's to be energy. There's to be warmth. Uh, again, we're not to be lazy. We're, be, we're to be excited and diligent in our service to God. Uh, somebody said attitudes are like colds. They're contagious. And so you're either a bucket of water uh, or a bucket of gas on a fire. You, you're the one that decides that. And so we lose our zeal uh, when other things steal our hearts like the world and our personal ambitions and, uh, and work and money and pleasure and sports and all these things that steal our zealousness for God. And so he says, don't be slothful, but be fervent in spirit. And look, then he says, be rejoicing in verse number 12. Rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. Now, I uh, don't need to tell you that our world's in a mess, but there's hope in Jesus. I'm glad that all of it's going to come out just like the Lord said. And when we can't rejoice in how bad it is down here, we can rejoice in how wonderful it is up there. And that God is going to be found faithful. Uh, and uh, every time found faithful, right now many times life seems miserable. You know, uh, we have this groaning within ourselves, though, waiting for the adoption, the Bible says in Romans 8, to wit the redemption of our bodies. To be caught up with him in the air. And when he comes, we'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Listen to Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. And that tree of life uh, is the promise of our one day being at home. Hey, look, I'm so glad that we don't have to get, um, uh, we don't have to get all sideways and chaotic when the world is. Uh, you know, they had this earthquake last week up there in... Uh, Various parts of the Northeast. I think it was, the epicenter was in New York, and it was a 4.8. A four, and they hadn't had, New Jersey, uh, they hadn't had an earthquake like that in 100 years, I think, uh, is what I heard. 100 years. And everybody was freaking out. Now, it took me a minute to get with it because we were in Japan when the 9.0 happened. And it was not unusual for us to have sixes and above over there uh, in Japan. And so I'm trying to watch the news and I'm trying to figure out why everybody's freaking out. I mean, to, to us, that was just a little wiggle. That's all that was. You know, and I realized when you hadn't felt anything like that for 100 years, it's a little shocker. <laughs> and so, man, our stuff's not built for this, whatever. And, uh, but in Japan, they build for that kind of thing. You know, uh, and uh, because of those, uh, because of those um, uh, earthquakes. As a matter of fact, I heard a story. Of one guy, he was running apparently up on the roof of one of these towers in New York. Now, I guess they have to put the gyms up on the roof because there's no place down on the ground. And apparently there's some kind of swimming pool there or something. And uh, when you go up that many floors and you get that little 4.8, they said the water was sloshing over the side of the, uh, of the tower and they're going right on down to the ground. So I, I would have to say that would freak me out a little bit. Uh, I remember preaching in the Philippines one time, and we stayed in a hotel there uh, in uh, Alabang. And uh, I, I don't remember the name of the hotel. I don't know. I, I don't know. But the, the top floor was where the uh, breakfast was. You know, like here in America, we go down to the first floor uh, and go out with our car usually after that when we're getting a little continental breakfast. Well, they had... Um, they had the breakfast up there. And oh man, did they have corned beef and hash. I'm telling you, that was good stuff. Uh, but anyway, there was a, a, a pool of water up there. And uh, it was filled all the way to the top. And it looked like it was running off the side of the building. And uh, I have to tell you, I sat there for a while and just kept looking for the plexiglass wall. And then I realized... There's not one. I even asked somebody, is there no fence or, you know, no, to stop people from going? No. Nope. Yeah. Well, why? Well, if they do that, they won't do it twice. <laughs> you know. Survival of the fittest. Amen. <laughs> right? Anyway, uh, I can imagine that being a little freaky for somebody up there. But, uh, you know, a 4.8 earthquake. 
uh, and uh, how that shook people to, you know, uh, to a, a great deal of fear. Look, uh, look uh, our world is getting ready to have more than a 4.8. And brother, the only thing that's going to keep us calm as we come into these pre-shocks, uh, 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 coming into that, is the fact that God's got it handled. We know Christ is our Savior. We know where we're going to be. We know it's all going to work out. We know as far as the uh, tribulation is concerned, the Lord's going to take us up out of here before that happens. Amen. Amen. And um, yeah, we, Brother Harper was talking about, uh, you know, a prophecy and, and all that. And, you know, sometimes I have to think to myself, especially when you read certain passages of Scripture like Daniel 11 and other things, and you're going, wow, wow. Uh, and how's all this going to play out? And sometimes I think to myself, you know what? I'll be watching it from heaven. Amen. I'll be, and then I'll be going, oh, boy, I missed that one. You know, whatever. But the fact of the matter is I'll be in heaven because the Bible says we're not appointed to wrath. Amen. And so we can rejoice in that. Rejoice in hope. That's what he's saying there in verse number 12. And then he mentions uh, not only these attitudes uh, and uh, loving the right, cleaving to that which is good, abhorring that which is evil, uh, and abhorring these uh, evil attitudes, choosing these good attitudes. But then he says in verse number 16 that we're to maintain unity and humility. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Now, it occurs to me uh, quite quickly as I look at verse number 16 uh, that the way to verse 16a is following verse 16b. You see? Uh, my, uh, be of the same mind one toward another. All right? Now, if I'm high-minded, am I minded toward another? The same mind? No. I'm minded more about myself. I'm exalting myself. I'm thinking more of myself. And so what do I do? I condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And many times you'll find out, as the Bible said, it's that kind of pride that causes contention among people. Divisions in the body and uh, because of uh, somebody thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to think. And so that leads us from our personal attitudes into our social attitudes, beginning in verse number 10. Back up in verse number 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. These, uh, verse 10 begins our attitudes toward the brethren. And he mentions there verse 10, verse number 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Uh, down in verse number 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. These are the attitudes toward the saints. Galatians 6 and verse 10 tells us, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. What's our attitude toward brethren? And they're reacting properly toward them. He says, love the brethren there in verse 10. Love them as ourselves because they're part of the family of God. And it is this love that, uh, that, um, uh, that comes out of our uh, heart because the Spirit of God is in our heart. 1 John 5, 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And uh, so, love, love. Look, now every one of us needs to think about this for a minute. Our personality is a reflection of what's in our heart. You know, because here's why I say that. Because a lot of people make excuses for their division because of uh, uh, quote-unquote personality conflicts. Have you heard that? All right, now then. So the Lord says that he wants us to love the brethren unless there's a personality conflict. That's not what he says, is it? So what do I need to do? I need to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. And I need to love. And it'll affect my personality. Um, so we're to love, not only love them, of course, in that fashion, but then in doing so, love them above ourselves. We're to love them uh, first, if you will. 
uh, 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 demonstrate that type of selflessness. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 24, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So that's what love does. It puts the brethren there first. You see it in the last part of verse number 10, in honor, preferring one another. Prefer. Uh, that means at the table, at the fellowship. Right? And most people that say, well, you can be first right after me. <laughs> In honor, preferring one another. Loving one another. Putting others first. All right. Uh, then he says not only to love the brethren, but provide for the needs of the brethren. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Uh, and to rejoice with them to do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Uh, do, let God use you to be a blessing and a help to those uh, in the household of faith that have need. Not just along the lines of these physical and material needs, but then also as it relates to their social needs, uh, uh, given to hospitality. Now, one of the things that we're losing in our society is hospitality. We become so self-focused, we don't even know how to be a blessing to others in hospitality. Hospitality, of course, is, uh, uh, means that we really we open ourselves to the service of others. We might be opening our home or uh, you know, making sure that we uh, can try to find a way to be, be a blessing. This is illustrated uh, in the uh, New Testament, uh, and uh, really it was an accepted part of the culture because uh, the Lord used it as a rebuke uh, for uh, certain ones when he came into their home and he said, you didn't wash my feet, you didn't offer me any oil. There are certain... Uh, acts of hospitality that we need to uh, exercise as Christians. It is, in a sense, being a refreshment to the brethren. And so we said a minute ago, it's always a blessing when somebody's trying to refresh us. But brother, we, we've got to try to be a refreshment to others. Uh, and uh, uh, to, to try to be hospitable toward them. And so uh, I, I like to encourage. Matter of fact, uh, I was thankful uh, many times this last week. Uh, um, I, I, we started at 7. We got out a little after 8 usually. Uh, and almost every night there were folks milling around the house of God, fellowshipping with one another, enjoying one another. And that's always a blessing. We need to learn to do that. We have a culture now that lives its social life behind a screen. Or in front of a screen. To the point where the only kind of uh, whatever emotion that some people show is in an emoji. We don't have any social, they used to call them social graces. Social skills. And why don't people like them? Because those are selfless. See? I exercise them toward others. It's a, you know, over the years you see it sometimes. Uh, somebody will accuse the church of not being friendly. And when you check them out, you find out that they're the ones that sat in the pew with a frump on their face the whole time. Sorry about that. Uh, interesting how some people want certain actions toward them that they're not willing to extend toward others. The Bible tells us that when our hearts are full of the Spirit, we want to, uh, we want to uh, uh, be hospitable, if you will. We want to be a refreshment and an encouragement. That provides for you know, the social needs of them. And then he mentions their spiritual needs. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. And so we're to encourage and uplift one another. Our hearts should groan when somebody's a groaning. Our hearts should rejoice when, uh, when somebody's rejoicing. Amen. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we see our attitude toward the brethren. What's our attitude toward brethren? Then our attitude toward the, un, uh, the unbeliever. Uh, beginning in verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Now, we could put verse 14 under the category of some brethren. There's some that just like to persecute you. They just want to be the thorn in the side. The pinprick that ruins your day. I'll tell you one thing, that's not the spirit, that's the flesh. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we could put it there, but really, uh, in the context of unbelievers, uh, the Bible uh, tells us, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. You know, we've, um, 
Uh, I've seen some believers when they're in the presence of unbelievers uh, who do not act like believers, right? I've seen some believers just get all bent out of shape and out of sorts. And if there ever was any kind of opportunity to witness to those people, they just blew it. And so he reminds us here that we're living in a world that we're supposed to be impacting, not letting it impact us. And so I want to, uh, I, I want to uh, have such a testimony with them that I can, uh, that I can be uh, not an encouragement to their sin, uh, but an encouragement for them maybe to think about their own heart, their own mind, their own ways, their own thinking, their own doing uh, in a positive, loving way. And so... Uh, he mentions that there. And here's what he, so here's what he says. Uh, we are to live right in front of unbelievers. Look at verse 17. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And so we ought to do right for the sake of our testimony. Your testimony many times is the first, of your, the first half, the first part, the introduction to your witness is your testimony. And if you don't have a good one, your witness is not going to go well after that. And so live right. Um, and uh, so uh, for years now, from time to time, somebody will say, well, now look, what do I do if I've blown my testimony? What do I do? Well, you do the right thing. You say, look, I am so sorry. I just kind of, I didn't catch myself. I, you know, I uh, sinned against you. I, something. But the best thing to do is own it. Don't try to go on and act like it didn't happen. Because if you do, that's only going to make it worse. It's just going to make it worse. So uh, live correctly in front of them. And then verse 18, look at this. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, you know what uh, blesses me is to hear the testimonies of many of you as we talk here before and after church, uh, uh, various gatherings of the church. And uh, you're talking about uh, your walk in your workplace. And it blesses my heart uh, to hear uh, uh, Christian uh, people uh, that are living, uh, you know, as a, as a minority in the world, trying to make sure they maintain a right testimony for Jesus Christ, develop relationships with people to a certain extent so they can open the door of witness to them. It, it's ble- that's what the Bible says do. As much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Do the best you can to get along. Now, don't let them, you know, getting along doesn't mean conceding into sin yourself, right? But um, uh, you, can, uh, you can live peaceably on the job, in your classroom, uh, and in such a manner where, uh, where people come to you, ask you questions uh, about the various questions of life. And then so he says, try to get along with them, and then... Uh, don't uh, don't uh, strike back when they wrong you. Uh, that's what he, you see in verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Right? Uh, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. And so God, God, the, the Bible says that godly will suffer persecution. I think about the number of martyrs of whom I've read over the years who were being tied to a stake to be burned. And they said the same thing that our Savior said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Or they prayed, or they quoted scriptures, or they sang hymns. Uh, And why would you do that? Because there's a very good chance that in that crowd of persecutors, there's a Saul holding coats. And you don't even know what God will do to prick the heart of that Saul to one day receive your Savior. And so... Uh, he says, don't, uh, uh, you know, don't uh, take vengeance uh, to yourself. Uh, and uh, so, m- matter of fact, look at Matthew 5, 44. And we're coming in for a landing here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Verse 43 says, ye have heard, Matthew 5, 43, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And so you see that again back in our text in uh, Romans 12. 
provide things honest in the sight of man. Uh, verse 17, excuse me, recompense to no man evil for evil in chapter 12 of Romans. Uh, down in uh, verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Remember the uh, illustration that I gave you uh, about the young man that would, I tried to witness to him and he laughed at me and I got upset and I got mad at God and thought, you know, and now you say stuff to God like, why, 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 why do you let people do that to us? Not fair. And the whole time we already forgot the cross. And the, uh, our Savior, who was holy, harmless, and undefiled, dying for us because we're sinners, that's not fair either. But thank God he did it. Uh, and then you find uh, the result of that in verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. And the whole idea, <laughs> verse 20, is not saying, look, I'm going to do good so he feels bad. Well, I mean, that should in the end, that ought to be, uh, you know, what happens. Uh, but all we're doing really uh, is um, uh, by our proper response, creating an environment in which the Holy Spirit of God can call somebody to consider their ways. To think about uh, what, they've, what they've done. Verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good that's it and so that's the way we ought to approach the world that's the way we ought to approach the unsaved and so when we come out of revival it's not a matter of us getting on a uh getting on our holy roller box and going into work next week and just cleaning everything up no you can't do that only god can do that by cleansing the human heart and salvation what you want to do is let the love of Christ be shed abroad in your heart and in your testimony to encourage people uh, to, to consider Christ as their Savior. And so look, uh, like I said this morning, when we have genuine revival, it affects us in such a way that the sphere of our life is also impacted for righteousness. Our personal attitudes, our social attitudes. We change. We have that spiritual attitude adjustment that conforms us in uh, so much so to the image of our Savior and makes our light shine brighter for Jesus Christ in the world. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer, please. I read about a advertisement where a little boy was standing on a soapbox and according to the advertisement his shadow was cast over uh, the ground there from his place on the soapbox and his shadow was on the ground and he's, po and he po and he's pointing at the shadow and the slogan underneath says that's the only thing I can't wash out now, look, your life is casting a shadow on somebody. All right? Your life is impacting somebody. And if you're not careful, it'll be something that you can't wash out. Lord, help us, we pray, to have right attitudes toward the saints, right attitude toward sinners. Lord, I pray that this revival that, uh, in which uh, so many... Uh, decisions were made, uh, salvation, and uh, Lord, other decisions as well, many other decisions, I pray that they will produce practical behavioral change that will help more come to salvation in Christ and help more Christians be strengthened by others. In Jesus' name I pray.